Good evening, everybody. Sorry, we're running a little late. Um, we are missing one of our speakers. So we were trying to wait for her to log in. Uh, we're going to give it a few more minutes as folks arrive. Um, so thank you for your patience. We will start shortly. And, and just real quickly, this evening, our speakers are Twala at Abrahamson Swan, and we also have Dr. Tommy Rock, and we are also waiting for um, Anna to join us. And here she is. Thank you. Hey, Talia. Hi, Anna. I'm sorry I can't get on the camera because of my internet. Oh, dear. Okay. No worries. No worries. Uh, we are... Okay. We are on and we are Facebook Live. So we're gonna go ahead and get started now. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you all, do a little bit of housekeeping, introduce you all, and then we'll jump into our, our dialogue and questions. So thank you everybody. And let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover. Good evening, relatives. Thank you for tuning in this evening. I want us all to recognize that wherever you may be tuning in on Turtle Island, that you are on native land. We predate so-called America. A little housekeeping before we get started. This session is being recorded. A link of this recording will be shared on our website. This session is also being uh, streamed Facebook Live. For those watching on Facebook, we will try to check to see if there are any comments and questions, um, but our apologies if we miss anything. All attendees are on mute and you're, you are not on display, so thank you. Um, no worries there. Please submit your questions throughout the teaching using the Q&A function. We will save all questions to have our panelists answer uh, following the teaching, uh, and then we will share that with our audiences. Uh, to register for the upcoming teachings, you may register at bit.ly, Native Perspectives Uranium. Um, and before we get started, I, again, I'd like to introduce myself and our panelists this evening. Shea Talia Boydentia, Torich Eatney and Schle, Toa Haglini Beshishin, Glashe Deshechero, Totobahan Deshinella. I am based in Gallup, New Mexico, and I was born and raised on the Great Diné Nation. I'm a mother and a community organizer, and I'm currently the land, uh, Cultural Landscapes Program Manager for the Grand Canyon Trust. Thank you all for joining, joining me this evening. Um, and before we get started again, I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists. Dr. Tommy Rock um, is a postdoctoral researcher in environmental health at the University of Utah. He has spent over a decade researching uranium exposure with the U New University of New Mexico and two years as a regulator for the Navajo Nation Environmental Protection Agency. He has published on assessing elevated levels of uranium in indigenous food sources, helping an indigenous population that was exposed to abandoned uranium mines. Thank you, Dr. Rock, for joining us this evening. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to introduce Anna Rondon. Anna Rondon is a Kiani clan born for Nakai Dene'e, whose grandparents are Tabahe and Nakai Dene'e. She is a dedicated lifetime advocate for the rights of indigenous people, which began from elementary school. Anna Rondon has worked in various leadership positions alongside many influential indigenous leaders and her own spiritual advisors, which has deeply rooted her, educated her in how to navigate movement building at the various levels of organizing for change and justice. Today, she serves as the program director for the New Mexico Social Justice and Equity Institute and the McKinley County Collaborative Health Equity Coordinator. She has also worked for the Navajo government um, as a land use planner and for the Eastern Navajo Agency Local Governance Office as an office manager for the Navajo Nation uh, Chichata chapter in New Mexico. She also worked with the Navajo Nation Department of Health where she was the pro program director for and co-principal investigator for the Navajo birth, birth cohort study, which was conducted in partnership with the University of New Mexico Community Environmental Health, the Navajo Area US Indian Health Services, and the Southwest Research Information Center and was funded by the Center of Disease Control Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Anna also worked as a Native Outreach Director for the Southwest Research Information Center and has worked with the organization New Energy Economy on the installation of solar units at the Crown Point Chapter House as part of advocacy efforts for the closure of the San Juan Generating Station to support environmental public health protections through pressuring the New Mexico Public Regulatory Commission and Public Service Company of New Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Anna. 
Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Twala Abrahamson Swan and, and her mother, Deb Abrahamson Swan. Spokane tribal members created SHAL, Sovereignty, Health, Air, Water, and Land Society, a grassroots organization based, based on the Spokane Indian Reservation. Community education efforts focused on envir environmental justice, health risk factors, and preventative strategies. Education about the effects of radiation and heavy metals and pathways of exposure, including traditional medicinal and sub substances <laughs> oh dear, I can't say this word. Subsistence foods and plants. Deb was raised in the area and owns a home at the mouth of the uh, Tishmakan Creek. Apologies if I mispronounced that, which is only a couple of miles downstream of the Don Mill site. Twala is a graduate of the from the University of Washington with a degree in environmental studies and minor in restoration of ecology. She has been a social and environmental justice organizer for almost 20 years. She has worked for several years in natural resources for the Spokane tribe and was recognized by the US EPA for outstanding community community education and outreach through the production of the inner tribal beat a Native American news and music show focused on environmental news in the Northwest region. She was also recognized by the private and nonprofit sectors for her community advocacy work on indoor air and water quality and radon issues in Indian country. Thank you Twala for joining us this evening. We have some amazing panelists and we have a lot to cover. Um, this evening we will be talking about the health impacts from uh, uranium exposure. And before we get started, I would like to note that we are all tribal members speaking from our own perspectives and experiences from working within our own tribal communities and others. <clears throat> and just to give a little bit of context for the dialogue that we'll be uh, speaking on this evening, uh, I would like to state this. Nuclear threats continue on tribal lands with new proposed uranium mining, milling and waste storage. From what we know, the health impacts are vast and extremely adverse. We are still learning what the cumulative impacts are because there have not been enough health studies conducted, especially within tribal communities. <clears throat> and because uranium processes, um, and because uranium processes both chemical toxicity and radioactivity, assessing the relative contributions to each of its toxic profiles is difficult. We need to create baselines for uranium impacted communities to begin to understand the various health disparities that we know are correlated to the exposure of radioactive contaminants. Adverse health effects range from renal failure and diminished bone growth to permanent damage to the DNA, including various cancers, increased kidney disease or, or failure, increased cardiovascular or heart disease, hypertension, high blood pressure, and autoimmune disease. <clears throat> There are changes, there are also changes in fertility and viability of offspring, determined from both animal studies and data on Hiroshima and Chernobyl survivors. These effects can be delayed for decades or for generations and are not detected in short term studies. There are also psych psychological impacts included. That includes human loss and bereavement, environmental losses and contamination, feelings of betrayal by the government fears of, about current and future effects of contamination and radiation exposure, prolonged duration of psychological effects, anxiety and depression, and factors of poverty and racism. Our tribal communities are still pleading for cumulative studies to help us understand exactly how we have been harmed. We need air, soil, water, and health studies. Radioactive pollution is invisible, and the burden of radioactive waste storage is immense and it is a problem worldwide. <clears throat> there is no permanent repository anywhere in the world for this waste, and no one wants radioact radioactive contaminants in their communities. The ongoing exploitation of uranium and other natural resources for the production of nuclear energy and the proliferation of weapons continues to <clears throat> extensively impact and subjugate already marginalized communities and heavily contributes to issues of health disparities, boom and bust economies, and systematic dispossession of cultural resources and ancestral land. This is environmental racism. Many more, including non-tribal communities, are unknowingly impacted by the mining, processing, transportation, and storage of radioactive material and waste. This evening, we will be discussing again the health impacts uh, from the nuclear fuel chain. So let's go ahead and dive in panelists. 
And um, this, these questions are open for all of our panelists. And so we don't have a specific order, um, but let's go ahead and kick off with Twala. <clears throat> what are some pathways of exposure to radioactive contaminants in tribal communities? Um, for us in the Pacific Northwest, um, we have a lot of water impacts. We have air impacts, um, but there is a lot of water flowing around the uranium sites that were open pit mines. And one of the sites that we're dealing with now, the Midnight Uranium Mine, when they were mining, they hit into the groundwater. So when we talk about the impacts, we will be looking at um, water treatment at that site forever, and also uh, the transportation and the creation of nuclear waste through that process as well. And um, I have a couple of pictures to show about that, but basically it's, it's showing the waste that's coming from our community down to the Four Corners area. Um, and so some of the things that us as community members, you know, we know our impacts when it comes down to the technical documents and the technical reports. Um, we often see that our issues are minimized and clearly written in the language that minimum impacts. So we're not doing any further studies. Dr. Rock, would you like to add to that? Yes. Um, first of all, like, uh, let me introduce myself in Nabo. And also just a, a couple of corrections. Like I was a postdoc at University of Utah with the, at the Rocky Mountain Center for Occupational Environment. I was the first Native American to do so. And right now I am working with um, with uh, Tulane Lake Enterprise and I'm part of the inclusive community consultant. And I'm also working with some grassroots from up north from the from Utah. And I got my master's degree from Northern Arizona U University and PhD from Northern Arizona University and my, my bachelor from Arizona State. And I've been involved with uranium research from 2006 from NAU to U University of New Mexico, back to um, Northern Arizona University as well, as well as doing some work with um, Navajo EPA as well. And to, to respond and add some more to, to, to the question is that in, when I talk about uranium and talk to the Hatkhali, the, the medicine men or knowledge holders, or they talk about not looking at just one element of, of of the environment because as native we use the whole environment from from water to soil to plant and um, air as well so when it comes to environmental exposure and looking at pathway exposure it's like i, I would i would say all of it all, all of the um um the environment the environment from water soil to plant and to to the food we eat as well as indigenous foods it's like for as as a Navajo, it's like um, as we all know, mine is very delicious. So, um, mm -hmm. so we look at pathway exposure from eating our delicious traditional mine. So, not not to say that that's only traditional food we eat. There's other traditional food that we eat, but. Those are some of the things that need to be looked at our traditional indigenous food. And there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And and, and with in light of what's going on with COVID and all, it's like it really put a shed a, a light on the lack of water infrastructure. So, so the most common way mm -hmm. of environmental exposure that I've seen so far is, is through water, dust as well, but more to water because a lot of people use these unregulated water sources for human consumption. So, so I, do a lot of, I do see a lot of that. But as more research um, are done, we will get a better understanding to the full extent of the type of pathway exposure that, that are being, um, that, that, that's out there that's not being seen at the moment. 
Thank you. Anna, would you like to add to the question? And, and I'll go ahead and repeat it um, real quick. What are some pathways of exposure to radioactive contaminants in tribal communities? Anna, are you there? Uh oh, we may have lost her. Um, so I can add a little bit to that. Yeah, so there, there's many pathways. Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Yep. We can Hell yeah. You. Hi. Oh, okay. Hi. <clears throat> I'm sorry. But the uh, the Navajo birth cohort study, you know, it was um, one of the, well, it was the second study. You know, there was the uh, Dene um, study out in Crown Point where they did uh, urine analysis um, back in 2007 with Southwest Research Information Center. Um, and then what you read, um, I was with the Southwest Indigenous Uranium Forum. Um, whoever wrote that Southwest Research Information Center, I didn't work for them. I just collaborated. But for the pathways, um, yes, it does come from different different uh, areas. Um, I think also the, the air, they did some air studies in Church Rock right by the community where they were moving um, mine waste. And so even though how careful they tried, you know, to drive, go back into the house, you know, that's another pathway um, is when you're walking into the, in, in the dust, when they are conducting the cleanup, um, we found uh, disturbing too was uh, when the children from the mining communities, when they're walking into the bus, you know, they have those traces of dust going into the bus. So there's a lot of other pathways that we discovered um, through community observation. The experts, they know the land, they know um, their body, they know their illnesses, um, but compounding upon that with these different pathways with the water, with the air, with, um, uh, I know there's a study at NAU with um, Janie Ingram, professor, she, she's done some studies on the sheep consumption of vegetation. <clears throat> but yes, there, need, there really needs to be a more wide range of, um, of research. Um, and of course, the stories really need to be archived because you know what we're talking about is genocidal policies. It's about killing of a people still today. Um, and that also goes back to the doctrine of discovery. No matter how much we try to fight in federal court or even with these federal agencies, they all fall back on the doctrine of discovery because they still see us as not fully human. We're still domestic dependent nations. We're not viewed as um, a full fledged nation. So whenever we fight in court, you know, it's always going to be a, a, a battle until we change the constitution. And I know Mark Charles, another Dene, amazing warrior uh, conjuring up the the warriors um, uh, our African American brothers and sisters that are also noted in there that the blood drop of three fifths that they're only three fifths of a human so until we destroy and and be at a, a, a different level of this long war um, you know, it's at every level, but I think going to the heart of the beast and then working down and, and destroying it and chopping it up is what we got to do at all angles. Um, because these, every time we have those dust storms, oh my God, in um, Talani Lake, in that area of the reservation, those dust storms are about a mile high and a mile wide. And that's where I seen for myself being in those dust storms. Um, so anyway, thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Anna. 
Yeah, absolutely. There are many pathways, everything from water, air, soil, um, internally. Yeah, we, it, there's a lot of damage that's being done. Let's go ahead and move on to our next question. Uh, what are some of the health impacts on communities living near uranium operations or nuclear facilities? And again, um, Anna just mentioned that there are a lot of a lot of stories that we hear um, out in the field from impacted communities, and um, those aren't told often. And so, a lot of us have worked in the field with, within our own tribal communities, and we have heard these stories firsthand. So, um, what are some of those impacts that you all have seen? And for me myself, you know, uh, growing up on the res. We're again, you know, and this is something that Ian Zabarte brought up in our last panel of being downwinders. You know, we're all downwind from the nuclear test sites here in the in the Four Corners area. Um, but on top of that, on Navajo too, we have all these abandoned uranium mines. And I lost my own grandmother to stomach cancer. And so, you know, we've all lost relatives to in some way or, or another to various cancers or other diseases that I had mentioned before. So um, Yes, panelists, um, please share with us what some of those impacts, health impacts that you've seen on communities who have been living near these uh, uranium operations or uranium facilities. Uh, for for me, it's like uh, doing some field, field work um, and talking to the community members. I've seen, I've seen and heard people talk about stomach cancer, kidney and liver, colon cancer, the need for toxins, like uh, some stuff related to consuming water. They talk about that. And uh, I've seen um, thyroid and I even seen um, a brain tumor as well. And also um, leukemia. Leukemia is like another one that I've, that I've, that I've run across to as well. And another one is where um, uh, FEMA won't have babies like um, cervical cancers. I, I've talked to women that have cervical cancers where they they won't they're unable to have kids anymore. Um, seeing that and and talk to people that had that. And and I think that the saddest one is like a being told about some of the health effects from kids. I mean kids. So so. Um, it's, it's really sad to see that when it comes to kids, um, for them going through that, it, it it really gets well. It got me angry when when I went ran across that. Yeah, this it's absolutely heartbreaking, and these are very very emotional issues for us to talk about. Again, a lot of us have lost. Um, our own family members, or we have family members who are dealing with these various diseases, and it's it's not easy to talk about. Um, and there's a lot of trauma that exists because we've lost so many people because of these issues. And so, thank you all for sharing. Sharing what you are sharing. Twala or Anna, would you like to add to that? Again, it's uh, what are some health impacts on communities in the near uranium facilities? Um, I think um, Ian mentioned it in the chat. It's like we're seeing the impacts that we knew about, but with the COVID on top of that, we're seeing funerals in our community. You know, they're not making it. We're, we're at a extinction point for my tribe in the Northwest as far as our culture and our language and who we are as a people. Um, so when we first started the organizing, it was really about, you know, learning about the contaminants, learning what are the potential health impacts. And then it, it just, it started to get closer and closer. And I think we've lost a majority of our original board of directors of our organization to cancer. Um, my mom, she's, fighting cancer right now, along with many of the women, our women warriors around the country, we're losing them. And so with them goes the knowledge 
that they carry, the work that they've done for us. And so it no longer is about, you know, the data and the studies. And it's, it's, we're at the point where we're at the survival point of our people right now. And all of these systems that are not functioning for our people, you know, they're being magnified right now as we look for health resources where our basic necessities being met, water, clean water, food. Um, and we don't deserve this at all. So seconding what Anna said is that for, you know, since contact, We've been treated like less than, and we're still being treated as less than, as even around us, as people think they're coming up with solutions. When we're left out of that process, um, our people are dying. Talia? Yeah. I'd like to respond to the person that said, um, air is everywhere. Um, when I say air is like a part of contaminants, what I mean is radon gas. That's what I mean. So whoever said that is like a needs to understand there are other forms of contaminants from uranium. It's just not. It's not just a heavy metal. It's not just radioactive. It's it's also gas. So for the person that mentioned that, that typed that, that's that's part of it. Yeah, thank you, Tommy. <clears throat> Anna, would you like to add to, to the question? Uh-oh, <laughs> it looks like we lost her again. Um, yeah, we've seen a lot of different health um, impacts. For, for me, organizing out here in New Mexico, Northwestern New Mexico, I've heard a lot of different stories. Um, you know, one woman, particular young woman, her father used to work in the mines and he would come home covered in, in yellow cake basically and wash his laundry with the families. Right? Or sometimes they would go into town and use the laundry mat facilities <clears throat> and wash their clothes there. So there, that again was another way of exposure for the community. Um, but her whole family, um, generations, have been wiped out. She lost her father, her two brothers, her sister who was pregnant at the time um, to uterine cancer. And um, she has two twin kids who, and her some surviving members who have to get annual screenings. Um, and she's constantly in fear that they will come back with something. Um, and so these are some of the things that I've heard being out in the field, and hearing from my relatives um, and it, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, you know, again, we are still pleading for studies in our, in our community. Um, Anna, would you like to add to that question? Yeah. Um, in terms of the health, first, um, Oh no, Anna, you're breaking up a little bit. I keep. Uh oh. Oh dear. Anna has so much to add. I know she does. <laughs> Let's give her a little minute here. Okay, I'm gonna stop the video. But in Blue Gap Touchy, a family that we met. Um, in, in the early 2000s, uh, they had a resolution from Blue Gap Chapter in, from 1986 to clean up the uranium mines in that community. Finally, 2006, 20 years later, we helped them organize um, the uranium uh, touchy cleanup committee. And, and so Helen had a a family of 12 children. Her husband worked at the mine. 
there in um, Blue Gap, Touchy. And of course, they were not paid um, on a payroll. They were given uh, like little coins to take to the trading post. But she had 12 children and seven of them all had Navajo neuropathy. And it's a term for Navajo because of the lack of nutrition we get and the darn um, her grandson what I learned at a community meeting um, his grandson he does not want to have children because he took care of his aunts and uncles at Navajo Neuropathy um, passed away before the age of 30. So imagine seven children. Um, it's one of the most heartbreaking uh, stories, and we, we are still in contact. And then you have a doctor from Indian Health Services. Oh, it's probably incest. Um, and that's another damaging um, insult. So, you know, there's still a lot of misinformation out there from Oh dear, we lost Anna. Are you? Yeah, we yeah. Um, I was done, but I don't know if you heard about the grandson not wanting to have children. Yeah, we caught we caught the very beginning of it. Okay. Anyway, I'll end right now. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Okay. Thank thank you, Anna. Okay, so let's go ahead and go, move on to our next question here. Um, what kind of health or environmental studies have been conducted to correlate environmental exposure and health disparities? And what have the results shown? What, have, uh, what work have you done or what work do you think should be done? Um, I see an impact to water, of course, and um, seeing elevated level of um, uranium and, and soil as well. Not only uranium, remember it's like, um, Uranium is not the only um, mineral that's in that in that uh, in that ore. There's like vanadium and radium as well. So it's a mixture of, of these that, that are present, which doesn't even get discussed in like in, in not only in this type of conversation like webinar or meetings with the community members or within or with the regulatory agent, tribal or federal. But there are other minerals that that are in in there that that are also um, harmful as well. That gives off radiation as well. And in terms of environmental studies and pathway exposures, um, plant. Uh, there was a question about plants. Um, different type of plants will uptake uraniums either in the stems or in, in the in the roots. So it it. It, it gets um, uptaken by, by different plants and stored in, by different plants in different ways. And when an animal eats that, it'll, it'll, it'll take some of that uranium with them. And in areas such as Cameron or in areas that are um, arid during the winter month, there are hardly any plants around. So I've seen the sheep that go around and, and eating these um, shrubs and air environments, they, they will eat the soils along with the plant and along with the root. So they'll take a, up, up take a lot more of those um, minerals. And I've seen a lot of that in, in, the, in the stomach because when you, when, you, when you do environmental research or getting a water sample, we use acid as a preservative and stomach has acid in it. So it acts as a preservative. So you see accumulation of uranium in the, in the stomach of, well, with the sheep in, in my case. And also like to respond to um, 
the question that was put on there about downwinders. Like, um, downwinders are like a different set of, of different type of exposure from different set of, of, of populations when the um, bombing happened. And and for uranium, that's another type of exposure that has that has happened that, that has to deal with um with related to uranium mining and um. Um, being exposed to different type of gases as well, but they're but they're all fall under the same umbrella. It's like when it comes to um, from uranium exposure or nuclear exposure. Thank thank you, Tommy. Um, I, before I get disconnected again, um, there's a metals superfund research program, and they're doing studies at. Uh, touchy blue gap on metals and the um, different soils, uh, very microscopic. And so that they could find any type of um, other types of uh, different minerals in these spaces that have been abandoned of uranium mining. But that's a study going on now and it's really cutting edge. And if you just Google metals, super fun research program, it'll take you right to the, that website. Thank you. As a, the, the other thing I forgot to mention is like, um, what type of research that needs to be done? I, I didn't answer that. It's like uh, the type of research that needs to be done is, is looking at um, traditional indigenous food um, and some of the plant as well that we use in ceremonies. There's a type of research that needs to be done as well, so so we'll have a better understanding of, of our environment when it comes to like pathway exposure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that, Tommy. And I really would like for you to talk a little bit about um, the work you did around the Sanders uh, community in the elementary school. But first, I want to go ahead and let uh, Twala um, provide some 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 of her feedback and input. Um, we were kind of fortunate in the, the creation of the cleanup plan of the Midnight Mine to get a few studies that the tribe requested um, when they were looking at exposure scenarios. Um, most of everything that was coming out of EPA had to do with, you know, a middle-aged white man and how the certain contaminants impacted that man. Um, and so it left out, you know, our traditional the amount of water we drink, the amount of time we're on the land, um, and uh, the animals. So in place of our traditional foods, they were trying to push forth at us, you know, cattle research or other type of research that didn't really apply to where we were at. Um, some of the progress that we did actually get into that report was um, an analysis of the impacts in a sweat lodge. So when we're talking about not having the data when we're inhaling the the vapors, you know, there for a lot of the contaminants, there wasn't that wasn't included as an exposure pathway. So when these contaminants were inhaled, it was a whole different story, just like the radon gas. And so when we talked about using contaminated water, contaminated rocks, we're surrounding ourselves with contaminated materials and then breathing that water, you know, we were able to include that in our exposure pathways. Um, and then that led to the creation of some more stringent water quality standards on the reservation that were really health-based rather than um, what, what they could measure in the labs. So our tribe used the health studies to base a lot of the, you know, what our water quality standards are. And um, so for a lot of that, it, it tries to bring it as close to zero as possible on some of the things, knowing that, you know, it's just a goal that we want to get to eventually. But um, it, it just seems like we, we learned a lot from especially the Southwest communities. And um, we're just so far behind up here in the Northwest in our access to information and resources related to uranium. And so 
the the nonprofit organizations were 10 or 15, 20 years ahead of the work that we were doing, but we were able to learn from very fast and kind of copy and do some of the same studies in our community because our tribe and our reservation is about the same size as one Navajo chapter. So I think our our tribal enrollment is about 2,900 right now. So it's a, you know, our, our tribal leadership is a council of five. So it's a lot smaller community to make some change and make some things happen a little bit faster, um, but without the resources around us, without the universities that have that expertise, without, you know, we don't have any of that within our surrounding um, colleges and we don't have the, the level of expertise that is down in your area. So we still continue and appreciate um, all the work that's happened down there because we've used that to kind of shape and make changes up in for our community. Awesome, thank you. Talia, are you gonna put links um, on some of the work that we're doing, like um, links to our websites or studies? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we will be, we have a ton of questions rolling in and these, we probably won't have enough time to get to those questions. So what we'll do is we'll put them in a parking lot and then we'll follow up with all of our panelists and then we'll have those questions answered. But we're, when we follow up with our audiences, we'll also include all the information um, such as your websites um, in, in your contact information, if you're okay with that. And then of course, any kind of um, outreach material or resources that you would like to share with the public. Um, and then just to jump back over to Tommy, um, uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about your work that you did in the Sanders community um, around, I believe it was water within the elementary school system, uh, water system? Oh yeah, um, this was an environmental justice grants that um, we, we did with Talani Enterprise with um, Janine Yazi, Chris Shuey, Jock Cerrone, and the community members from the Pickle River Valley. And this was a um, uh, community science where the community I, I, um, trained them how to collect samples, uh, how to uh, show them how accordance is used, show them from the raw data and how, how it can be used in a scientific way to help address some of the environmental contaminants. Well, in this case, it was water and how to use pol policy, um, like the safe drinking water to address those exposure, which was a, a chronic exposure. We, we did that with the community. And once we found out the public water was um, contaminated from uranium, and the community asked to sample the school. We asked the superintendent at the time, and he agreed. So we got a sample from there. And anytime um, when we do sampling, anytime you see elevated level, you go back and get another sample for confirmation purposes. So we did that for confirmation purposes. And we informed the community again, and we had a couple of meetings with them. Never EPA was involved, like they came to the meeting and all, and Sanders is off the reservation. So Never EPA had no jurisdiction in, in that small community. It fell under the, the state, um, Arizona Department of Environmental Equality. So we had a, um, a really big fight with uh, the regulators from the state and the federal government. And, and when we had the uh, conference calls with them, the federal, with the federal agency, USCP from Region 9, one of the um, employees from Region 9, he, he was saying that it wasn't, it wasn't chronic exposure. So Chris Shuey, um, break down or define what chronic exposure was. And we came back and told them, it was like, uh, yeah, it is. And we went back and forth, went back and forth. And, and I remember in one of those meetings, NQA came to the meeting. He, um, Rex Kuntz mentioned that they have a water line in Newlands, then they have a well that's further south of Sanders. They can get the water line into the community of Sanders. But the problem was the community had to choose. Um, either the community of Sanders get the water or the elementary can get the water. It can't do both. It did not have enough pressure. So the community community had that um, had to make a choice. I remember like um, 
a, a majority of the community members just started crying. And and the community got the water. The school said no um, to to that idea, and and Intrigue um, put water in, uh, gave the water to Sanders, and um, they're under double double trouble utility authority. To my understanding, not all of the community in Sanders are tied to Intrigue water at the moment. I don't know where it's at. This was like a two years ago when I found that out. So I don't know where it's at, at the moment. And the elementary school, elementary middle school, they ha um, they got a water filtration system from Red Mesa. Um, further north, they have the similar problem. They have like um, arsenic problem as well. So they got the water filtration system from there. I don't know um, how well it's working. So I haven't go and checked that out yet. But this is an ex a really good example of how a grassroots organization uh, partnering up with someone that knows um, science or do research when they come together, they can do something about it. And when we did this, we helped change the law in the state of Arizona when it came to small public water system, which is a really big deal because there's other community members or not other community that has um, small public water system that have um, issues related to water, we were able, to, from the artwork, they were able to address some of those problems as well. So um, it just shows you that like minds coming together can help um, address their, their environmental issues. Yes, thank you, Tommy. Yeah, and um, just to kind of give a little bit more context um, to some of that contamination or some of the contamination out here in, in northwestern New Mexico, uh, uh, Church Rock is the site of the largest radioactive spill to date in U.S. history, and that happened on July 16th, 1979, where over 94 million tons of radioactive sludge um, spilled into the arroyos, went into the Rio Perco, past the Arizona, New Mexico state line, all the way to the little Colorado River. And Sanders is along that route. So every community between Church Rock and the little Colorado has been impacted on some level. And so again, we're still, you know, finding um, out how we're being impacted and how much harm mm -hmm. has been done in our communities um, from, from uranium. So thank you all for sharing those excellent insights. <clears throat> oh, yeah. uh, it's like uh, I'm, I'm still I'm still doing some work in the Perkle River River Valley in Sanders. Like today is like um with the help of Daisy, I was gonna go collect some soil samples, and and I was unable to do that. But uh, we're gonna go back and get those samples as well, and look at um, some more water sample as well. To get a um, better understanding when it comes to. Heavy metal, not only uranium, but other heavy metal as well. Um, and see which um, heavy metals are elevated as well, besides uranium, and look at the soil as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we just, we got a question in about um, hemp. Where, where did I see it? Has anyone on the panel heard anything about using hemp to remediate uranium pollution? Um, yes, there was a study with um, US EPA. I believe it was in Ohio. They did a study on using hemp to um, remediate the radioactive particles in the soil to uptake it. However, the disposal is the issue. Um, and then also, also the I don't know the the principle of using another plant. You know, it's like putting them into trauma. You know, our life, our our plant people, they have feelings. So that's one of our our concerns in terms of using that medicine for cleaning up somebody's mess. So it still needs to be looked at and explored. I'm not sure what the recent studies are, but um, yeah, the waste issue is huge as well. 
Yeah, and that's what it all comes back to in the end, right, with the whole nuclear fuel chain is that there is no safe permanent place for repository anywhere in the world for this stuff, and nobody wants to deal with radioactive waste. Um, on top of hemp, you know, I've heard feedback from like, not only is, is hemp one of our plant relatives, right, and, and we don't want to exploit it in such a way, um, but yeah, it goes back to the waste, because once it absorbs all that waste, we have to figure out what to do with that contaminated hemp, right? Um, and then I heard another thing about using fungi or mushrooms uh, to also as a way to absorb radioactive contaminants. Um, but again, it goes back to where, where do we put that waste in the end? Um, I've also heard about clay. Um, there's a, also been other uh, remediation uh, uh, options or, or innovations that have been coming up. On, and those are some of the ones I've heard about. I don't know if any of the panelists um, have anything to add there. With, uh, when, it come, when it comes to hemp, that's uh, when you're using plant, they call that phyto, phytoremediation. And I know for hemp, it can help improve the soil and it also address the heavy metals in water as well. So um, and that's the other thing. That's uh, another upside to using hemp as well. And that's, that's one of the things that I, I would like to do to see how well it will improve a water contaminated by uranium. And, and uh, it's I able to proposal and I haven't get it funded yet. So it's crossing my finger that it will get funded soon. Come on, folks, let's fund Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> let's put a shout out out there. <laughs> uh, Twala, would you like to add anything there? Um, just in relation to the plants in our area, um, we're heavily forested, um, the, the areas surrounding our uranium sites. And so there's definitely in the reporting and they say there's areas that are for sure impacted, maybe impacted. And then, you know, it's kind of these levels of maybe. Um, but what we've seen is when we're when nobody's watching, they'll try to burn that waste. So it, it does become an issue as the, especially these big, large pine trees become contaminated um, because of what that's going to do as the pile settles. So as they're trying to bury this waste, if there's a big mountain of trees, that's going to settle a lot different than the rocks that they're burying. So it is a, an issue in our community. And in 2015, we had a wildfire that almost wiped our reservation out. And the mining company wanted it to burn, you know, because that would have taken care of their waste problem. Um, we didn't get anybody to come to, you know, to do an evacuation or to do anything. And the easiest thing would, if, if they would have let it burn. Um, but luckily, um, we had to stand up and say, no, you know, they didn't even have a good updated list of what kind of chemicals they were holding on the site. And, and so it was just a big mess as the fires reached the edge of our, you know, this, this um, contaminated area. Yeah, that's um, very similar to what happened at the Los Alamos National Labs a few years ago here in New Mexico when we had a big, huge wildfire and it came very close to the facilities and their, um, the cylinders that store this waste. Um, and they were freaking out because they didn't know what to do. And of course, they didn't have any kind of, um, you know, emergency plan in place. And if they did, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't good. Um, and so, you know, those, those instances do come up. And those are other things that are issues that we have to deal with within our communities. Um, I just realized we are running out of time here. We have about five minutes left. So I want to go ahead and um, we didn't get to get through all the questions, but I do have one more question that I would like to ask all of you. And that is, what does environmental justice look like for you personally? And Twala, can I go ahead and ask you to kick us off? Um, yeah, I, I just, it's, you know, just generations of policies, generations of greed, generations of the lack of regard for us as human beings in the, you know, the resource extraction in our communities. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've had 
in dealing with the U.S. government and the the top mining company in the world. You know, those that's who we're up against in, in these environmental justice fights. And um, and so, it's, yeah, it's just that kind of being born into a legacy of contamination and trying to help your community. Well, well for me, it's like environmental justice. That's um, all, all, all aspect of life, like from infant to elders, and it has to do with like um, um, with even though it's like well for me it's like uh, even though you have this science background or doing research and you have these this evidence. Even though you have that, and you use their own method, their own things back at them, they still would disregard you and question you. Um, and I, I've seen that many times with other um, scientists, uh, like um, not only in Navajo but other places as well, because because. I think when it comes to environmental issue or, or uranium, it's like um, we we can't continue fighting this uh, alone. It's like individually, like tribes, we 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 need to start coming together and start addressing it together. We're we're way stronger with our sovereignty when we, when it comes to this issue. So as in my opinion, the way to address environmental justice that's happening, um, or injustice that's happening is like. We all need to come together with our, with our um, um, knowledge and and our, our strength, and and start addressing it together. So, as 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 long as we keep fighting it individually as a tribal nation, we will continue to do that. And it's easy for them to, to to um, to disregard us. And. And I see a lot of that. It's like I've been looking at the literatures and looking at um, different groups, not just only Native, but different other minorities that are facing the same issues when it comes to environmental, environmental justice issues, like from inner city, like in Chicago, to back east, to west, to Puerto Rico and all. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Anna, would you like to um, answer? Again, it's uh, what does environmental justice look like to you personally? Environmental justice is just one component, right? Um, but in looking at it from a indigenous perspective, you know, we look at it as a living, as our mother and what's above is our father. And for us, it's a different worldview compared to US EPA coming out from Region 9. <laughs> we sat in meetings with those guys. They have no clue what we're talking about in Church Rock or anywhere else. And that's the problem is that there's no institutional history from one Navajo Nation government leader to another. Perfect example is what we're dealing with right now. You got young Navajo leaders that have no clue on how to use sovereignty, on how to stand up to the federal government. Right now, you know, I've seen leaders in the 70s and the 60s that stood up to these the federal agents and congressional people. But the next, these younger generation, my grandchildren are going to have to, they're going to inherit this issue. So what we do is we teach them. We arm them with the information. Just like what um, Tommy Rock, he's one of our warriors, up being toe to toe, challenging the norm of his profession. That's what it takes for those that have that intellect and also that traditional knowledge 
that grounding is so important. So that's how I see environmental justice is working through our, our families, through our children, through our eh, through the through our inter indigenous nations spirituality, through our um, peyote ceremonies, the different ceremonies that we that ties us together in this in this new millennium. And going back to rewriting our narrative. We got to rewrite it. We got to tell the truth. I can't. Thank Sorry. you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Anna. Charlie, can, can I get a real quick example of, of the stuff that happened in Sandra and Washington, D.C., real quick? Yeah. It's like a, um, there's a delegation of us that went to Washington, the, the Washington D.C. to address the uranium issue in Indian countries, like um, from the southwest all the way up north, and with different tribes. Um, and we went to the headquarters for USCPA in, in Washington D.C. And there were um, a group of us, and they took us to a big conference room. Uh, we were on one side and the US EPA was on the, on the other side. All they ever did was let us vent and they sat there quiet. By the time we, we left, nothing's been, none of our question has been answered. None of it was solved. No plan, no long-term, short-term plans, nothing. And that's the reason why I say is like, uh, we need to start coming together from the grassroots. The tribal government can follow us because they work for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're taxpayers. We're the ones that are cleaning. We're flipping the bill for the cleanup. So, you know, we should be a part of every part of this process. Thank you all. Oh, thank you, Talia and Twala. I see you on Facebook. I haven't met you, but I really appreciate your work and um, our prayers are with you. And I pray that, you know, you're, you're gonna heal and you're gonna um, create a, a, a larger path for your people, for your next generations to come. I know your ancestors are proud of you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I, I am blown away by all the amazing people who have, um, been so gracious to honor us um, throughout all of these teaching series that I've organized. And it, it's been amazing. Thank you all so much for your tremendous hard work, your sacrifice and your deep dedication to your communities and, and to justice. This is, it is needed. We are all needed when it comes to these issues. And before we end, I'd like to just end with a quote. All things are connected like the blood which unites one family. All things are connected whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons of earth man did not weave the web of life he is merely a strand in it whatever he does to the web he does to himself author unknown thank you all for joining us this evening again thank you wonderful panelists for um, giving us some excellent insight and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us and for taking time out of your busy schedules to, to be here with us this evening. I would like to welcome everyone back next Thursday as we will dive into our next panel. We will be discussing the social and cultural impacts in tribal communities from the nuclear fuel chain. Thank you all so much. And I look forward to seeing everybody back next Thursday. Thank yeah. you. Woo, we're gonna do this. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Oh, I'm doing it. <laughs> doing it. Oh, you wishy? I'm going to. Oh. Talia, I have all the questions saved in a document. I'll email them to you. So I'm gonna, okay, sounds good. I'll go ahead and end them end the session now. Thank you for okay. everything you guys do. Yay, 
thank you everybody thank you have a good night okay.